Thunderbird Lodge, the home of the Rose Valley Museum, and supported by the Centennial Foundation, Rose Valley. Um, we are going to load the bus in about five minutes. I want to introduce uh, our Mayor Emeritus Tim Plummer. And Tim has a, a handout there for all of you. We're happy to welcome many of our people that are here in the borough and some that live outside the borough that have heard about us. We have a wonderful thing presentation to make today. We have, it's been a trail that's been hacked out and now it's led by the Boy Scouts. So you shouldn't have any trouble going along. And it's just going to be a wonderful day. And it looks like there's going to be no rain, which is fabulous. But we've had an awful lot of committee working very hard for some weeks now to prepare for the day. And we look forward to their comments when they finish. was built by the Minquas Indians, and Minquas is kind of interesting because it's Lenape, which is the language of the people that, that were originally here, uh, for a group of Indians that were living up closer to what's present-day Harrisburg, along the Susquehanna River, that uh, are usually referred to as the Susquehannocks, but the Lenape called them Minquas because it means the mean ones, because the two tribes did not get along. <laughs> and uh, it, the, tra the trade tr trail here opened because the Europeans were uh, demanding beaver skins above all other furs because th the fur was being made into men's felted hats, which was the rage in Europe. And the demand was so high from the Dutch and the English before even the Swedes got here in the 1630s and 40s that beaver was gone in southeastern Pennsylvania. They had to go into central Pennsylvania to get beaver. And to get uh, a better price, the Minquas learned that if they came in and were waiting for them, when they knew a ship was coming, they, they, they sometimes could get a better price than if they had to wait and, and hope that it, someone would make the trip all the way out to where they were living. So Norm Glass, uh, who's a restoration uh, carpenter and uh, historian uh, gave a talk here at the uh, school in Rose Valley a few months back on the Minquas Trail. Has a variety of Indian artifacts uh, and things to show. And I am George Ambrose from the Lower Swedish Cabin in Upper Darby. And we uh, are on land and inter interacted with the Lenape. So I portray a peddler who has brought items that both the uh, Lenape want and items that we wanted from the Mon Lenape. So we'd like the group to self-divide into a group with Norm's side, a group on my side, and then when you come back, back, we can do the other side as you're waiting for your bus. The trail that you're going to be walking on is known as today as the Minquish Trail, named for the Minquis Indians, the Minquis Indians. It's the earliest road of commerce in Pennsylvania because it was used by the Dutch and the Swedes to trade, take trade goods out to the Susquehanna Indians and bring furs, like George said, back. And this is a beaver pelt here. Uh, they would have brought tens of thousands of those back with them. Uh, and deer skins and any other kind of skins, coyotes and um, any, any other kind of fur. But the road, it was a road of commerce and it, it probably predates, obviously predates the Europeans as a trail, Indian trail. And in later years, it became the road west. Um, the earliest settled areas of Lancaster County around the Hans Hur House are on Penn Grant Road, which is basically the Minquish Trail. And it's actually a marker that says this is the earliest settled area of Lancaster County. And they would have come by way of this road. So, and also there were Indian treaties and Indian conferences Sometimes the Indians would come to Philadelphia or to the Swedish or Dutch settlements. Other times the dignitaries would go to them at their, at their Indian towns. Twice William Penn went out in the 1680s and early 1700s to conferences. So 
just think about this when you're walking the trail that you're walking in William Penn's footsteps. You actually are walking in his footsteps. And in one of the earlier governors, Governor Gordon, he, he would come out to different governors and different dignitaries. I can't remember their names now, but a lot of them you'd probably remember or know if I remember their names that walked to this trail. Now, when they went out to trade or to do a conference, they didn't just go out with a couple of people. Like William Penn didn't go out by himself. He would have had an entourage. Same thing with the traders, because the traders traded tons of goods from heavy cast iron pots to heavy ax heads to everything you can think of. They, they had an entourage of probably 20, 30 people, plus pack animals like horses or oxen uh, would go out with a big you know, parade of people and goods to go out there. They, they were licensed, they had to be licensed by the government, the local government at the time, and they would have, a tra eventually when they became known to the Indians and had worked, worked it out with the Indians, they would have a cabin, a log cabin set up, which would be their trading post. When the Indians went east, especially the Swedish and, and Dutch days, they would trade at like Fort Maniunk or Fort Beaver's Reed, which were the Dutch and Swedish forts on the Schuylkill River. Um, one of the earliest trading posts, posts was set up by Jonas Nielsen. It was off of Island Avenue down by the um, International Airport on a creek called Mingo Creek, which is now under about 50 foot of river dredging fill. All to the left of Island Avenue as you're going to the airport, that wasteland down there. It used to be beautiful valleys and trees. And he came over as a soldier to guard the fort at Fort Tinicum, Fort, um, Fort um, uh, uh, yeah, anyways, the Fort at Tinicum the Governor Prince built. And when his tour of duty was over, rather than going back to Sweden, he decided to get a license and trade to the Indians. And he built this trading post on the Minkris Trail, which went through that area. Um, so he's probably one of the earliest licensed traders. Later, there were other traders in the 17 and 1800s, uh, or in 1600s, that were, would go west. And like, when I say west, like to Downingtown or the other side of Delaware County. As the frontier, moved west, um, at one point, when I'm involved with the Swedish cabin, as George is, when that was built in the 1650s, where we're standing was unknown territory. This was the frontier. So as Europeans came over and settled, the frontier kept moving until we finally hit the Pacific Ocean in the 19th century. But so as, as that happened, the traders would move west with the Indians. Um, like by the 18th century, most of the trading was going on out in Pittsburgh area in Western Pennsylvania and Ohio. But in this, in our earlier century, they were, it was the Susquehanna River. And as George said, there were two main tribes in the area, the Lenai Lenape who lived in this area, who were divided into three clans, the turtle, the fox, and the turkey. Um, the turtle, the wolf, and the, and the turkey, I'm sorry. Um, and the one clan was in New Jersey area, another clan was in this part of Pennsylvania and the other clan was up near Muncie, up, 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 up near Muncie, up the, um, not Muncie, up the Delaware River above Trenton, up towards like Matamoras, up in that area. Um, they were the Lenai Lenape, who later became known as the Delaware Indians, named for the Delaware River, which was named for Lord Delaware, who was an early set, uh, explorer. Um, the Susquehannocks on the Susquehanna River eventually were annihilated and disappeared from history. Were re, um, they were renamed the Conestogian Indians because by the 18th century they had shrunk down to a few hundred who lived in a town called the Conestoga Town, which is where a lot of the treaties that William Penn went to was. By the French Indian War they had dwindled down to just a, a few, and a lot of them were massacred by the Paxton Boys in the 1760s, um, what was left of them. Um, so they. They, the re other reason they kind of dwindled down from thousands when John Smith first discovered them in the early 1600s was they were a warlike tribe, as George said, mostly feared by other Indians, always trying to outdo other Indians by taking their territory and killing them and putting them under their jurisdiction, you might say. But because of all this warlike atmosphere that they had for their, for their whole existence, and Europeans bringing diseases over, they were dwindled down to next to nothing until they disappeared. Whereas the Lenape, who weren't as warlike, warlike, are still in existing as the Delaware Indians living in, in Oklahoma. They still are around. Um, a lot of Indian tribes from the 17th and 18th century and earlier ended up 
being eradicated by other tribes until they, they don't exist anymore. I mean, that whole branch of Indian Indian tribes don't exist anymore. They, it's one of the things they did in their wars. It's like Europeans, they not only just killed the other warriors, they killed women and children too. They tried to eradicate um, the whole, I mean, doing that is nothing new in history. It was actually worse back then than it is today. I mean, it's, been, it's still going on in the 21st century. Um, so what you see here is, I'll try to make this short because I'm going to get hollered at it. It's time for you guys to leave. <laughs> These are some items that were traded to the Indians of the tons of stuff that was taken out there. I mean, everything that a European had from clothing to shoes to blankets to coats to cooking, cooking kettles and utensils, big heavy cast iron kettles, glass bottles, the copper and the brass down there I have a brass kettle. And they had big kettles, they weren't, and you know, big bottles and big pots. To ironware such as axes and hammers and saws and, and then clay pipes. And the colorful things here are called trade beads. They were made in Italy and Venice. Venice specialized in making trade beads, specifically to be traded to American Indians or Africans um, in Africa, because they were trading to Africa at the same time as they were trading over here. And, and the Indians love these colorful, fancy beads. They were traded like four L's for a certain skin, and an L was from the tip of your fingers to your elbow. So they'd come in long strands and they'd measure them that way, like four of them would be four times. And, and they'd, they basically had price list, you know, like a small beaver like that might be worth, I don't know, say five L's of beads, if you were trading for beads. And of course knives, they, they love their knives. The Indian was in the Stone Age until that point of their introduction to Europeans. And this is called a hammer stone. It was prehistoric, found on a, on a farm near Honeybrook. You can actually see where it was used to strike things. And it fits nicely in your palm, but that's the kind of things they use with stone. They had, they had stone axes. This is a small little axe head, prehistoric. But then they went from that to these kinds of axes. And these are exciting because these were actually dug at a Susquehannock site about 50 years ago, known as the Strickler site. And they're Dutch or Swedish, they were brought out there by, this one has a little stamp on it. And they were used, they were traded to the, to the Susquehannocks, but in order to get there, these items came right out this trail. This thing was on this trail 400 years ago, heading probably on the back of an ox and heading west. And here it is again today, right where it was 400 years ago, which is kind of exciting. Made of iron? Yeah, they're iron made in Europe. This stamp, which is a cross, I lost it, Sun's, sun moved, I can't see it now. I think it's right there. Oh, there it is. Yeah. This stamp, they had guilds in Europe, and when they made things, they had a specialized stamp they had to stamp their things with to prove that they were a member of the guild. And there's actually books out that show these different kinds of stamps that they had for these trade axes. And there were companies in, um, or men and companies in Europe and in, in Canada that specifically made things just to trade to the Indians. That was the whole business. What you had was, you had trade companies that were the sponsors of these traders that were like investors, you might say. As a matter of fact, a lot of our early um, settlements like Jamestown and Plymouth and the Swedes and the Dutch, they didn't just come over to farm. They came over because they were sponsored by a trade company who basically wanted money. They wanted profits. And the profits and the money were from furs. And of course, in Virginia, sometimes after the furs, it was tobacco. Um, but they wanted, they wanted money back. Uh, one of the things in New England that they shipped back to England for the, to make profit was um, for ship masts. They were the tall pine trees and they would ship them by the ship line back there. They would cut them down and strip them of their bark and everything and ship them back for masts for, for tall ships. Uh, so none of this was done just out of a whim. It was done for a reason. Um, and the, and the, usually the traders didn't have the money to buy all this stuff. It was, it was sponsored to them by their by their sponsors or their, their investors. And then they would come back. They would make money too, but they would come back and bring the skins back, get paid um, there for their services, and then the investors would then take the ship them over to England uh, or Europe and then make their money. It was all about money. It was all about the Benjamins. <laughs> and on that note, Time we have to, to move. Now we will be back here at the end and we'll go and listen to the other side.
but now we're gonna walk down the Minquist Trail down the hill to where it crossed Ridley Creek. This is the trailhead. Uh, this kiosk is an Eagle Scout project. It was just installed this summer. There's a similar kiosk at the Saw Preserve. This is the map that was developed by the Environmental Advisory Council. Jim is a member that just walked by. There are maps for the Saw Preserve and Chadwick Preserve, which is where we are today. So when you come over to visit, you can hit the QR code and download the map on your phone and then take it with you. We also have a virtual tour and it's for an organization called Clio, which is a university sponsored application. It has its own QR code and it's a virtual tour that describes in some detail all of the points of interest. So it's a low impact statement that we're trying to make. Um, we should start with an acknowledgement of our indigenous forebears and, and appreciate that they were caretakers, they were custodians of this land, and it's our honor to be here today. There are walking sticks if you want to take one. Good idea to do so. We're going to start descending downhill, okay? And again, slower steps. This is not street walking. Slower steps, a steady pace, bend your knees, watch where you're going, okay? And, and listen for the, the sounds of nature, enjoy the fresh air, uh, the trees, the native plants. And the sound of the stream. And the sound of the stream when we get here. I just want to point out that this is a, a, a deer impact project. It was also an Eagle Scout project uh, done with Roger Latham, who you're gonna meet momentarily. And it was to identify what happened to um, plants in a closed environment where the deer were not eating. We have a large deer population. And so, um, again, this is, you can learn about it on our Clio app. Um, but it's it's a, a work in project. So we made uh, trail markers at intersections of trails. Uh, you can see that this is the Minkwas Trail that we're on, and it intersects with the Long Point Trail that goes this way. We wanted to make low impact uh, signposts. This was made from a black walnut tree that fell. Uh, and it was hand carved. And then the tiles were made in Doylestown at the Moravian Tile Works. And we have, we have Mercer tiles throughout Rose Valley. So it was appropriate 110 years later to use tiles to mark our trails. Hi, welcome everyone. Um, welcome friends, as we say in the world of Quakers. Uh, my name's Ryan Burley. I'm the curator at the Rose Valley Museum at Thunderbird Lodge. Um, we have a group of friends from Darby, um, Darby Meeting. These are real live Quakers <laughs> in the 21st century. And um, Emily, Orla, Lizzie, my partner, and Harold, and you'll be hearing a little more from Harold in a few minutes. So we're, we're here uh, representing Darby Meeting, of course, but just Quakerism in general to tell you a little bit about the Quaker story here in this region, as well as touch on some of the Lenape heritage. Um, and there's a handout at the end, uh, which you can take to learn a little bit more. Make sure you have a chance to look at some of the slides presented before you head to your next uh, destination along the trail. So I'll hand it over uh, to Harold. So what I'm gonna do today is give you a brief, the briefest of overviews of what are Quakers, because I'm guessing that most people don't know unless they think Quaker, they think motor oil, or they think oatmeal, right? So they're a 
religious group that grew up in the 1650s in England in response to the chaos of their 10 year long civil war. So what are their beliefs? Well, they were strict Christians uh, following the teachings of Jesus and they couldn't understand why two Christian groups, the Protestants and Catholics were killing each other, okay? So they believed that they had a shared purpose and that was to model an alternative way to have a society, okay? Uh, and challenge others to act the same. Uh, they believe that God communicates directly with people and you do not need the aid of ordained clergy. So the Quakers did not have ordained clergy. Uh, they believe that people don't need churches, rituals, sacraments, holy days to practice their religion. Rather, the religion is something that you should exude in your everyday life, right? You should practice what you preach. Don't just save it for Sunday. Uh, and finally, worship is silent until someone feels moved to get up and speak. Yeah. Okay. So, early Quaker values are four. Pretty simple. Simplicity. You should only use the resources that you need so that other people have resources too. And it's important when you spend money to spend money in a wise way that's to the benefit of the community. Secondly, uh, is the testimony to truth, that one should live and promote and act in truthfulness and with integrity. And you should not be afraid to challenge people in positions of power to act with integrity too, right? Finally, the testimony to equality, uh, and that idea is that the light of God is in everyone, therefore we are equal. And finally, the testimony to peace, that nonviolent confrontation is always superior than going to war. Okay, problem is that England is based on a hierarchy, okay, in which the top 1% own 35% of everything, the top 8% own 90% of everything, and the bottom 92% own just 10%. Sound familiar? Okay. So, as a result, the Quakers who went around preaching their philosophy were seen as heretics and troublemakers by the people at the top of the pyramid. Okay, so enter this guy, William Penn. So, William Penn grew up as an Anglican, and he experienced the Civil War, and he was repelled by it. Uh, he came upon the teachings uh, of the Religious Society of Friends and joined by age 22. I think it's important that you know that he was the son of the Admiral of the... We're going right there now, okay? <laughs> so, the king, here's the king, okay? See, look. Okay, so the king had borrowed a lot of money from William Penn's father, who was a admiral, and in those days when you... Uh, basically captured a foreign ship, you got to keep it, so you made a lot of money. Uh, anyway, so he, uh, William Penn's father had lent the king a lot of money to persecute the war, and when he died in 1680, uh, William Penn went to collect because he had to pay the debtors of his father, okay? So the king had an idea, because he didn't have any money, but he had an idea, and that is, that I'm, how about this? How about if I give you land in this place called something in America, yeah. North America. It's kind of around Delaware and New Jersey in exchange for the debt that I owe your father, okay? And you can take all your friends and go there. So that was the plan to get rid of the troublesome Quakers. Okay, so William Penn, he <clears throat> turned around and what he did is he um, sold this to the Quakers on the idea that we're going to have a quote holy experiment which will be a government based on Christianity and the Quaker values that that was the whole idea so Pennsylvania was set up to be an intentional community so think about that mm -hmm. like Rose Valley was supposed to be an intentional community but 
wasn't it the first place that allowed people of any other religion to come? We're getting there. <laughs> We're getting there. <laughs> We're getting there. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, I, I, you can grade me when I'm done. All right. All right. So core ideas is simplicity, truth, equality, and peace, and the golden rule, right? So here we go. Key features of the holy experiment. A new approach to government. We're going to let people have a say. Well, it's not going to be everybody. It's just going to be white guys because we've seen women drive, so we know the answer there. Okay. No military, which was unheard of. You're laughing. Your wife's going to be mad at you. Uh, yeah. Next, freedom of religion, which was unheard of, unique for the era. In those days, whatever the religion of the king was, you had to follow. Okay. Uh, enlightened penal code. Prison is going to be about reform, not punishment. Okay. Next, jobs for everybody. Okay. Mm -hmm. Next, <clears throat> we're going to have education for everybody, even women. <laughs> okay. And town planning for healthy living. One of every 10 acres is set aside for green space. Mm -hmm. Right. And finally, a commonwealth that uh, nature's resources belong to who? Nature. Everybody. Nature. Commonwealth, right? Commonwealth. To everybody. Not just oh, there's oil in your land, so you get the resources. No, it's everybody. right, everybody. Okay. So finally, uh, fair treatment of native peoples and previous colonists. Okay, so that's the plan. And here's how it's going to go there's going to be one colony. Uh, the Welsh wanted to have their own thing and they said no, one colony here. And Penn is the proprietor. There are three counties. Bonus points for people that know who are the three original counties. Okay. Chester. Chestershire, right? Bucks. Bucks. Philadelphia. Okay. Was Bucks named after? Buckinghamshire. Okay. But that's too long to say, so we just go to Bucks, right? Okay, so how then each county is subdivided into townships. And in the beginning, each township has one meeting, and that meeting is also the government for that township. The green dots. Right? So here's a, a map of what it looked like in 1690, and you can check that out. Okay, so uh, Penn didn't show up until October 27th of 1862. 1682. He, sorry, 1682. <laughs> and he wrote it wrong on the thing. Okay, and he showed up in Upland, right, which he renamed Chester because Upland had been the name given by the Swedes who had got here before the English. And by 1700, to give you perspective, 90% of the inhabitants of Chester County were Quakers. Wow, right. So it's here that the first, here being Chester, that the first General Assembly convenes in December and they adopt the great law, a humanitarian code that became the fundamental basis of Pennsylvania law and which guarantees liberty of conscience. This law attracted many non-Quakers and by 1756, they became a political minority, the Quakers, and the holy experiment had failed. That map that's going around has the four different years and it will show you the progression of other religious groups that came to settle. Right, so it's kind of interesting. Okay, so uh, down to the end here. So I wanted to talk about Quakers and slavery and at the founding of the colony, 70% of the Quakers were slaveholders. Mm -hmm. But the, the Quakers that came from Darby were not, and I don't have time to explain that. Uh, that's a whole other presentation. Uh, in 1688, four Quakers in Germantown wrote a letter to their meeting and to the yearly meeting, which is the overarching entity, and said, we don't understand this because the golden rule says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And I wouldn't want to be a slave, would you? So they're like, please explain this because we're obviously stupid. Um, and of course, this got people thinking because they're like, you know, they're right. So uh, anyway, by 1694, the meetings of our area, which collectively met four times a year in what was called the Chester Quarterly, they counseled their brethren 
to not be concerned in slaveholding, that slaveholding was inconsistent with their beliefs. Mm -hmm. By 1775, they had convinced all the Quakers in the Philadelphia area, and they said you could either be a slaveholder or a Quaker, but not both. By 1780, the Quakers in government were able to get a law passed in, uh, <clears throat> in the legislature, uh, basically saying that from this point on, any uh, children born of uh, an enslaved person would be a servant until age 28, and then they would be free, and that during that time they must be educated and taught a trade. So this is called gradual manumission, is the word I was looking for. Okay, and final thing is the Quakers uh, in the 1840s basically lamented that they let non-Quakers hear and they became a minority. Bye. <laughs> Party on. Let me. Thank you, so much. Thank you Harold. Tremendous. This is our first go around today. Um, I just want, would like to add that there were three Quaker brothers from Cheshire that came on the ship uh, Friendship, uh, the vessel Friendship in 1682. They landed at Upland in August of 1682 and they were given essentially a thousand acres that they divided three ways between the three brothers, uh, Thomas, Randall, and Robert Vernon. So we are in the middle of Robert Vernon's tract, um, just across uh, Ridley Creek. If you come down Old Mill Lane, you see the house that's now called the Bishop White House. That is believed to be Robert Vernon's home. Um, it was expanded upon by Will Price at the turn of the century. And the other two uh, Vernon homes still exist in other parts of Rose Valley. They are the ones that largely settled this area and were responsible for uh, dividing up the land amongst their uh, grandchildren later on post-revolution. So thanks for being here. Thank you. Thanks for being here and supporting us. Thank you. New sign that the Environmental Advisory Council is installed, and you're going to meet Roger, who wrote it. And uh, this is what we suspect is the root of the Mincross path that crossed the creek here. Okay, so there's a rock formation that runs all along Long Point and then up the hill on the other side and it's Wissahickon schist and gneiss and some quartz and mica and some marble and it dammed up the creek. It prevented him from going straight. It really wanted to go that way, but it forced it to go all the way down here. Then there was a weak spot. It's found its way through and after it gets over that rock formation, it's always running shallow like that through rapids. And it's, it'll always run that way, you know, for probably the next million years because of this rock formation. So the Indians knew they could always cross here with good footing, nice stones underneath. And the house on the other side is named Minkwas Trail on the old map of Rose Valley because the Minkwas Trail went through their backyard and you could see it. In our lifetimes, there was still a part of that Minkless Trail in there, uh, in their yard. Okay, so sometimes the creek gets dammed up, that's hairpin turn by trees that come down, and the, then the stream goes through this gully. So it, in a hurricane, the water will go through here, and in a big hurricane, all this will be underwater. <laughs> Okay, so this is Dave Fern, our mm -hmm. council president, and Roger Latham on the EAC, Dr. Roger Latham. The founder and they're going to of talk EAC. about the Environmental Advisory Council and their work. Now, there are how many miles of trails, Roger? Oh, I wish I knew. I should two, be, I should be better Two prepared. miles all together? Inside here. Yes, yeah. perhaps. Maybe. Okay, so those trails which the EAC has cut and maintains, all volunteers 
and we're happy to help you have your your help if you're interested yeah. why don't you come around here so you can see the uh, trail map i don't know whether has everyone seen this <laughs> we saw it at the trail oh, okay at the kiosk. that's good yeah. Here's a, so this nice network of trails and really uh before what three years ago there was only the one that was blue we added all the other ones mm. since then so the EAC, Environmental Advisory Council, is appointed by Borough Council, and the state makes the rules. There are seven voting members, which is a state rule, and we have uh, advisory, just like our name. We have advisory. Uh, Borough Council asks us to advise them on environmental matters. And uh, the trail system is one thing that we do, and you've seen all the, the handmade um, heartwood walnut posts and mm -hmm. the Mercer tiles showing mm -hmm. the, it, it, Did someone already talk, tell you about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we do a few other things, including uh, you saw the deer exposure fence as you were walking in. Did anyone point that out to you? Yes. Yeah. I that's, pointed out the back. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, that was a, a demonstration project we did to uh, figure out what the deer population that lives here is doing to the to the ecosystem basically so we uh a, a eagle scout for his project built a fence not by himself with it all his helpers and another eagle scout for his project planted exactly the same array of native plants inside and outside the fence so about 90 plants inside and outside of nine different species of native plants woody and perennial and then we waited a year and a half and then we could see exactly what the deer were doing and nobody else so that fence is permeable to rabbits groundhogs all the other plants plants all the other animals that eat plants except for deer so we knew exactly uh, the, re the, the results were from deer and uh, if you're interested in the results they are posted at rosevalleyeac.org it's a very interesting report. I highly recommend it. Of course, I wrote it. Written by the Eagle Scout? <laughs> yeah, this is what happened. Basically, yeah. the inside of the fence, things were lush and beautiful and flowering, and all that. outside the fence, there was almost nothing left. <clears throat> so we still had the deer problem. But interestingly, and, and you might notice if you look around, that the only, uh, mostly the only shrubs, and the only trees of any small stature are either non-native invasives like that Japanese angelica tree over there or if they're native they have wire fences around them. Um, we don't have any tree reproduction natural tree reproduction here yet but we hope that will happen because at the Saul sanctuary which is this one Saul preserve uh, you probably most of you are familiar with it is um, about 10 years or so ago, we noticed that trees were reproducing again for the first time in a long time. And what we think is going on is that that preserve has become a really popular place to walk dogs. And dogs to a deer, a dog is a wolf. And dog pee smells like wolf pee. And uh, deer spend a lot less time eating and they might even just move out of the neighborhood where there's a lot of dogs. Sure. So you so. think you're having fun when you walk your dog, but actually you're doing a valuable public service. Your little, dog's a hero. So bring him know. over here. Please, if you walk, if you want to walk your dog, bring him here. Um, we'll, we'll see if we can get the, our tree reproduction. And they don't just eat the trees, they also rub their antlers against it, which is another reason why we have these cages around the uh, around a lot of the plants that were here um, the uh, if you look across there you'll see the mountain of white flowered stuff right across the water that's Japanese knotweed the entire area over there where you saw the um, where you saw the uh, the plaque for the pink was crossing that was completely covered with a Japanese knotweed and we're, nothing else would grow there. Which gets to be 10 feet tall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It grows really densely. So we, we treated that for a number of years with some herbicide, kind of knocked it back enough uh, that we were able to plant a lot of the native plants here. We got a, a grant from Pennsylvania, Growing Greener. Uh, we planted 300 native trees and bushes. 
uh, and about 100 native perennials, and we used uh, volunteer labor, about 380 hours work. Uh, mm -hmm. was, again, that was an Eagle Scouts were helping us out. Uh, in case you don't know, Eagle Scouts are basically, uh, Scouts who need Eagle projects are basically uh, Rose Valley's Public Works Department. <laughs> so, um, and we also had uh, some uh, fraternities come out that were looking for their uh, volunteer hours from Westchester and Widener. Uh, and the CRC uh, Watershed Association, uh, what CRC plus Roger actually wrote the grant in the first place. Um, so it's, you know, we're, the idea will be that these eventually will get tall enough that they'll produce enough shade so that knotweed can't get established. Uh, that's not happening yet. There's still plenty of knotweed back there. And we have someone who comes out with a little spray bottle and spritzes each one because you don't want to do broadcasting. You just end up killing the plants that you've planted. So it becomes a you know big problem, but we get a lot of volunteer work hours out here. We do I think two volunteer day work days, uh, at least two volunteer work days. It's very satisfying. You get to pull up some weeds. You think you've done something you know for good, and you're out in the fresh air getting exercise. So uh, you know we encourage you to come out on, really on our fun. work days. It's really <laughs> fun. Mm -hmm. I have a come question out. about the dogs. Okay. Yeah. Is that something that's been noticed? You know widely in other places or is this just something you guys picked up on here we picked up on it here and of course we don't know that we're totally right but okay. we can't think of any other explanation interesting and i have <laughs> not heard anybody else talk about it for as okay. as a thing yeah. in you can actually place. buy coyote urine and, and things of that nature and spray your your plants to keep mm -hmm. the deer away you have yeah. to keep on doing mm -hmm. it but um okay. i had lots of pastas up on i sit below the street and todd morton had lots of hostas up on the street down by my house and the deer used to eat them and then suddenly they weren't and I thought and my neighbors were still complaining oh the deer ate my hostas and I'm like well I don't know why I'm being so lucky this is great I had two dogs for a number of years and as soon as they were both gone the oh, hosta started oh, disappearing wow. on the street as well as That's right out my back door yeah. you know? interesting yeah it's called the ecology of fear I guess so yeah because it's not necessarily even wolves it's not necessarily that the wolves will eat that many deer it's just that the deer know they're there and so they they're more hands off or mouth off and they would be they they have stress hormones and those stress hormones make them less likely to have twins or triplets <laughs> and so you get a cascade effect okay so i think we have to go on to our next Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> See you. Thank Great you very much. So, again, okay. What I'm going to suggest is we walk up to the next presentation, and while we're while we're there, you could have a drink of water, um, a snack if you need it. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is a switchback. We'll take our time going up here. It's a nice and chist. And when we get up top, I'll show you oh, section of the ridge here the big stone we passed on the way that big stone fell a long time ago fell off what had been quite higher than it is now we're in the piedmont the what's called the piedmont off the appalachian so um it's a it's obviously it's a much older range where we are here. That rock formation down along the creek is amazing too. Some of the, the schist there. Oh, yes. Huge rock formations. Hello, hello. We're seekers after knowledge. We roam the world so wide. We look for truths invisible. We walk or skip for stride. Hop, dance, or scurry. We look. Sweep or hurry, whatever needs to be, however we can see, we bring a little cheer with our knowledge. Gather around, everyone. <laughs> this is our William Price. He'll say a few words. Hello, and everyone. Thank you. Welcome, friends. Um, as my lovely wife, Emma Webb uh, Price, just sang to you, we are <laughs> the seekers after knowledge. <laughs> Uh, I am Will Price, born of these lands and returned to them, my uh, favorite lands of Rose Valley. Uh, the Seekers After Knowledge was a social group 
Um, social groups were all the rage in those days, and it's what young people did to kill time and amuse themselves. And so they would get together and they would read poems to each other, read plays, sing songs, put on performances, go hiking, play cricket, and one of their favorite uh, activities was outings. They called it going on an outing. And everybody went to where we are located right now. There used to be, believe it or not, a cabin here. There are a couple of pictures while it was still existing. It stuck out over the uh, bank there and was held with some pillars in the ground. There is nothing left of it but the remains of the chimney and on the opposite side uh, you can see the cut out of the fireplace box and this was one of the areas that the seekers after knowledge used to love to come and spend their time. Uh, they, they did uh, trips to upstate Pennsylvania, they did a trip to Maine um, and they, li they liked to incorporate, they were big fans of the native population, the Lenape and these lands. And it may sound like cultural appropriation because it kind of is cultural appropriation, but it hit the 1884 year differently than it hits the 2023 year. I choose to interpret it that Will Price and the Seekers were just enormous fans of the Lenape people that they encountered and liked to borrow some of their words and terms for things like you'll hear the term wigwam, which is actually a dwelling, not a tent. It's uh, an actual structure. But um, this is the journal that I kept on a certain outing where we went to Eaglesmere for two weeks in upstate Pennsylvania and I kept copious notes of every adventure, every activity. And it was the first time that I laid eyes on young Emma Webb. And I, I was, was a lot younger then. I, I was quite smitten, clearly, because I recorded it all and kept a journal. And then coming back from the outing, over the course of the next year, I reduced all of those notes to poetry and illustration. I drew every illustration. I bound it together. And the following Christmas, Christmas of 1885, I gave it to her as a Christmas present. So clearly, I was kind of hot for Emma Webb. And in 1884, boys did things to get girls. It's pretty a uh, long story that uh, outlasts all of us. And so it eventually worked because a mere three years after I spent my whole year making this book and giving it to her, three years later, she finally agreed to marry me. These stories are all taken directly word for word from that journal. Yeah. The Quaker way of laying out the week, first day, they refer to third day, fifth day, first day. First day is Sunday, so everything follows after that. So for example, this is from the journal, fifth day, August 24th, 1884. That's mm -hmm. Thursday. If you ask me why this shouting, why this noise and great rejoicing in the morning bright and early with the dew and damp of meadows, with the whirling smoke of wigwams and the rushing back and forward with their frequent repetitions and their wild reverberations, as of dancing on a barn floor. I will answer, I should tell you, from the well-kept grounds at Stenton, from the campus of the college, from the land of Penn, their founder, from before the time of Cromwell, from far away in the darkness, while the tribes of man still lingered near the cradle of the nations, sons of Ham discovered crickets, <laughs> played it there upon the meadows, taught their cousins how to play it, played it there upon the meadows. Then, as westward moved the nations, moved the great tribes to the westward, moved to conquer and to build up all the wild land to the westward, took with them this game of cricket as a priceless treasure, took it, taught it unto their children, kept it safe through war and bloodshed, through the weary march of winter, through the summer drought or famine, Thus the father taught the children, 
taught them how to swing the willow. Passed it thus while states were forming. Passed it thus while old states crumbled. Went it with the march of nations till the great day of this story. Found the game of cricket with us. Found us ready for to play it. This is how the men and maidens played the ancient game of cricket. Played it right before the wigwam. Used the wigwam for a clubhouse. George McFarlane was captain of the inside at the starting, having won the toss of copper, took the inside at the starting. I will put my Hannah in first. She, the stately Jersey maiden, <laughs> she, the maiden from the sand hills, straight she seized the bat of willow, seized it firmly with her left hand, placed her right hand just above it. Then she strode unto the wicket, placed her handsome foot before it, and defended thus her wicket, with her knees and dress projecting, covering all our rusty, rustic wicket. Then the ball flew from the bowler straight and swift and sure his aim was, but the wary Hannah caught it, sent the ball ah. out through the paling, thus the inside scored their first run, hooray! Yow! But Ed Paxson, he was bowler, he the lean and lanky bowler, you shall hear of all his mischief, how he bowled their placid Hannah, how he troubled much their Lila, how he smashed the boss bat's wicket. On the first ball took her wicket, she the BB of the inside, but the demon fun was up now all this curves and break defeated or from out the clubhouse ambled jesse with a grim smile ambled jesse she ambled with the bat of willow placed the willow on the block hole with her dress the most defended thus she started thus she ended ended all those curves and angles all the breaks and piggy rooters drove the demon bowler crazy drove him frantic to the clubhouse Thus the inside beat the offside. Only once they beat the offside, for the offside beat the inside. Three times out of four they beat them, beat them at the game of cricket. Thus the game of cricket started, thus the game of cricket ended. Then before the cozy wigwam, right inside the fence of pickets, there upon the meadows was it, was that jolly game of cricket. Yay! Yeah. Woo! Our poem, that another from the journal, comes from second day, that'd be Monday, July 21st, 1884. Early I'll wake, then down to the lake with the dawn's first break in the morning. I'll take a row without a bow at the first glow in the dawning. She untied the boat. It took but a minute, but an oar was afloat before she got in it. She reached for the floater. She slipped in the water. This festive young daughter. She slipped in the water before she had order. <laughs> <laughs> then she pranced all around with one foot on the ground. She said she'd be bound if the boys ever found how she had been drowned. She'd make it red hot for the girls who came not but slept by the spot from which she had got so early that morning. But the boys heard the clatter and soon knew the matter and they asked the young daughter just why she had sat her down thus on the water, for she might have known better, and that it would wet her. <laughs> uh, we've got our last story, For, uh, which, which is the third day. Right, which would be Tuesday. 7-22-1884. They spent all the next morning till dinner time in teaching and learning the game of cricket. After supper, they took a canoe ride. The evening was beautiful, the lake smooth and the clouds of many shapes and colors. All these together with the singing and the bright costumes of the girls made it a time long to be remembered. Soon after dark, a camp was discovered on the lakeside. The war hoops of the tribe were immediately sounded. One, two, three, S-A-K, hurrah! This was answered by M-B-C-G, hurrah! From the camp. Being still dumb, a test cry was proposed by the cricket. Three cheers for Jim Blaine, the mighty chief. The response to this was so hearty as to remove all doubts. Fires were soon kindled by the water's edge, and many jolly greetings were exchanged. The campers inquired for a lost canoe and two sheep who had gone astray. Our punster gave them the information that we had 
mutton for dinner today. <laughs> Which seemed to settle their anxiety in a gale of merriment. And amidst a rousing chorus of, Mary had a little lamb, little lamb, little lamb. Mary had a little lamb whose fleece was white as snow. The canoeist rode away, greatly enjoying the lights and inflections cast by the campfire. I had frequently noticed the strong musical spirit of this tribe. They were always singing when not otherwise engaged. They sang on their walks and they sang whenever they happened to stop. <clears throat> on this evening, having sung themselves hoarse, full of spirits, uh, no, not that kind. No. 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 Uh, ready for any fun that might turn up. Someone suggested peanuts. Then the hilarious girls with the fossil, the professor, and the cricket rushed wildly toward the supply camp. Helter skelter, they flew down the trail wildly into the wigwam and demanded peanuts. All gone, said the keeper. But I have sour balls and chewing gum. All right, said the Braves, and proceeded to buy him out. Chocolate drops, mint drops, coconut strips, and sour balls were laid in. And the march back commenced under favorable circumstances. But what ails the fossil, said one. See, he makes faces and looks agonized. He stands on one foot and lifts the other up with that motion peculiar to a cow in fly time. Nothing, quote the fossil. Have some coconut strips? They had some and followed the fossil's trail to the roadside and imitated him exactly. All that was left of the coconut strips were fed to Jesse. <coughs> In justice to Jesse, I would add that these toxic strips were brought here by General Sullivan's army in 1782. And she, having an antiquarian taste, assimilated them with alacrity. Here, have a chocolate kiss for the journey. The rest of it. Thank you for listening Thank to you. us. Thank, Thank you. you. This is called Nice, and it's part of the Piedmont Foundation, and there is a little bit of schist. Uh, you'll see some mica, the shiny um, glass-like stone that's embedded in it. Um, and this is really what we have here in Rose Valley, in the Piedmont, actually. So from, from Maryland up to New York, on the right side, of the the range that was here originally it was created by heat and pressure and so it was subterranean um, probably think of lava so temperatures in the 2000 degree range and then the pressure of overlaying rock that would press it literally almost like um, like it was plastic into sheets and so you can see the way it was exposed up and the sheets are now vertical they would have been horizontal in their creation but it's it's a pretty interesting geology that we have here in rose valley so at this point i think you have survived if you've made it to here it's downhill it's all downhill from here. You're not, hopefully no one's going to have a heart attack. This looks like a pretty fit group anyway. So this is, this rock is called Spine Kopf. It's the highest spot on Long Point. And in the winter time, if you look up the creek, you can see, you know, a long way up towards Media. And on the other side, you look down the creek, you can see a long way towards Chester. So any, native people standing here would have a commanding view of the countryside they know exactly who's here uh, and there's another spot in todd morton that's slightly higher other than that this is the highest point between the atlantic ocean and here so it's all downhill till you go swimming in the atlantic <laughs> okay we'll go that way and we're almost back to where we started I've kind of arranged this in, in the uh, variety of, of trading uh, items. So some of them are uh, Indians 
what the Indians were trading for and others were what they were trading with. And one of the things that people don't realize is that uh, ship, ship owners and, and people trying to get settlers to come to America, uh, who, and they weren't too excited about that idea, I uh, told them to trip, oh, it'll take about two weeks. And it, sometimes they average more like two months. And one of the things that they ran out of first was food. So their very uh, initial need was food. And uh, I'm sure you've all heard of the three sisters. Mm -hmm. yeah. These are the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash. And this was not only food for now, but they all had seeds of various kinds mm -hmm. uh, that could be stored and then planted. And the Indians gave tips like putting your fish heads and fish tails in the, in the soil to enrich it and things like that so that they began to, to feed themselves on locally available produce. Um, they all they made most of what they needed. Uh, they wove baskets. They used uh, I don't know if you know uh, what this is. This is sinew. This is sinew. This is muscle tissue from from the leg of a deer, and it splits as it dries, and can be uh, sized and then used for sewing, fishing lines, uh, nets all sorts of products. So the deer was a very utilitarian animal for the Indians. They used every part of that. And uh, here's here's kind of a novel thing, uh, a pipe made out of an antler, a piece of antler. And they, they were very self-reliant, but they had no working knowledge of metal. So anything metal was almost magical to them. And, and so very basic items like like thimbles. I was in the camp, the Indian camp while I was trading because I'm a peddler and and I was using this to mend my shirt and they all were and I wasn't sure what and here they were interested in the thimble because not only was it metal but it's it's decorated and so now I learned yeah. that I need to wear one because I, I saw this is what they did with it. They punctured the top, mm -hmm. threaded it, and, and wear it as, a, as an amulet. So now I wear it to advertise that I have those to trade with. Their, their currency, if you want to call it that, was wampum. And it was made from shells. And if you've gone to the beach, you know that most shells turn white and bleach in the sun and the salt water. So that if you can find a, a bit of shell that still retains some of its original color and fashion beads out of that, those purple beads are worth 10 times what a white bead is worth. And so there was a hierarchy of the trade. And again, so uh, we, we developed glass and ceramic imitations of wampum. And, and that's also desirable because it's, it's uh, European made. Another product that the Indians were using primarily in ceremonies. Ceremonies. Uh, I'm gonna just, just talk quickly about two. If I were to go over here and try to find the small tree growing that, that was supple, uh, I wa I'd want it to replace my bow. Before I cut that tree and used it, I would offer it a, a thank you gift of tobacco. And so th they were using tobacco ceremonially and so here's a here's a ceremonial pipe that's been carved out of, of soapstone, which is another Indians Indians trading with other Indians were, were trading for minerals that were in their area but not in, in uh, the home area, and so uh, they protected their pipe, put it away, used it only for special occasions. They started seeing when the, when the Europeans saw that they were. Oh, here it is. The, the uh, Europeans were, were using little clay pipes, mm -hmm. and the Indians said, oh, we can, we, we can do tobacco on an everyday basis. You don't have to just use it in ceremonies. These Europeans are just smoking it all the time. So believe it or not, the, the clay pipes made in, in Europe became a trade item for the tobacco when, when they brought a bunch over. There's a story uh, I just heard recently of William Penn when he landed, offloading two barrels, two barrels full of clay pipes to bolster trade with the locals and, and to give his gifts when he arrived. So um, metal knives, 
they they had knives that, that were hard, cut from flank flick from stone and were very sharp but if they dropped it it would shatter on a rock same way they had pottery but if you you drop that pottery it would shatter uh, we bring uh, Sweden for example which was a 17th century colonist in this area was rich in copper we brought two grades of copper with us uh, a thin grade to trade with the Indians and a heavier grade to trade with the settlers because settlers knew good copper so they wanted good <laughs> copper the indians didn't know better uh use this and when it burned through what we found them doing was cutting uh triangular pieces out of the the burnt through pot to uh make uh arrow points but they needed they needed a replacement so some of the first built uh planned obsolescence was in the trade for the, for the grade of, right? yeah. the trade of, of <laughs> copper. They they had luxurious <laughs> hair, yes. Uh, yes, and and so uh, uh, th these combs uh, and and people shudder when I tell you these were primarily used by the Europeans to rid their hair of lice. These were lice combs, but the the Indians wanted combs. So uh, again, these were all relatively inexpensive items, but. Uh, w were desired because they were foreign and exotic and sometimes they were a better replacement uh, bells like that we would put on on our, our sheep or whatever to keep track of them as, as they walked around if they they traded for the bells and what they did was attach them and it added to the musicality of their dance uh, fish hooks they were using a sinew sinew line and a bone hook and when we showed them metal fish hooks Boom. Another another relatively inexpensive, easily available product, but it was desired. So thanks everybody for coming today. We are back at the Rose Eye Museum at Thunderbird Lodge. This is the Museum of the Arts and Crafts movement of Will Price, his extended family craftspeople founded in 1901 uh, they moved here and restored the old mill for a furniture shop most of our museum is dedicated to about 25 pieces of original Rose Valley furniture they also had uh, a potter who uh, had his shop upstairs at Artsman's Hall that became Hedro Theater and so we have a display of Rose Valley pottery. And finally, a publication called The Artsman, which uh, was a monthly publication that uh, described the philosophy and um, uh, also provided uh, uh, examples of some of the furniture and products made here. Uh, so we have a great website, rosevalleymuseum.org. We welcome you to visit there learn about future events.